Good late afternoon, evening. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Ludwig, for the opportunity to speak here today to you and the whole Ecolops project as part of the Ecolops talk. In the following 35 to 40 minutes, I will first deal with certain notions of the political, then we'll reflect upon question of movement and dwelling of animals, and both will happen in constant recourse to questions of cohabitation. So on the one hand, we have certain ideas of species specificity in husbandry. In German, it's often called artgerechte Haltung. So species specific form of, of husbandry. They have very often become literally organic meat, a better form um, to live upon, so to speak. At least that's uh, how um, the advertising goes. And this idea of, of species specificity combines concepts of the good life with images of the beautiful life, both for the animals and the humans involved. But me as a philosopher, I'm concerned here with something else. Animals and humans are viewed here as political companions or comrades or colleagues. So what I wanna do is to narrate the history and presence of animals from a perspective of struggle, of fighting. And in my understanding, this notion can give rise to non-innocent forms of solidarity. Instead, leaving us stuck in certain paternalistic traps of compassionate ethics and responsibility rhetorics. The word solidarity, as we use it today, has certain roots, so to speak, in Roman law. A, a, a legal, it is a legal construction. Yeah? A, a community of solidarity was an association of individuals in which every participant could be held fully legally responsi uh, responsible for the behavior of every other participant. So if you four of you are building a, a solidaristic association, if I produce certain debts, let's say 1 million euros, it's the responsibility of the others in the group wouldn't be quarter million, quarter million, quarter million, but everybody in this group is responsible totally for my debts and, and my wrongdoing. So, so it's a, something to do with entirety. So solidarity, it seems, is not a zero-sum game. But the opposite. Solidarity, in my understanding, is risky. It's expensive. It's transformative. And it takes place between equals, at least in perspective, in potentiality. Maybe it's the utmost horizon that we can even imagine. But still, it is something on the horizon, a potentiality of us being equals and not just me being the great human who helps somebody, an animal, a plant, or, or somebody else. To paraphrase the biologist and philosopher Kurt Riechelmann, solidarity means that the beauty of nature and the beauty of society are not separated from each other. An undifferentiated, uh, a depoliticized notion of empathy, on the other hand, can even lead to the modernization of, of exploitation. As it is the case in some contemporary slaughterhouses, where the resistance, the anger, the panic of the animals are, are avoided through subtle and very smart design techniques, and thereby immunizing these architectures of mass death against empathic critique. You cannot immediately see an animal in pain. 
And that makes it, oh, then maybe it is okay. So empathy without politics, it's a problem. Not empathy in general or <laughs> feeling connected to others, but just depoliticizing, de depoliticizing empathy. Um, and this is also generally to be true of, of, the, of the modern wars of the 20th century. Um, you need political critique. If you just look at the victims, sometimes the victims are not that visible or, or violence um, take other forms maybe. So it's also always important also have a, um, a political viewpoint on these uh, issues. Because on the other side, it's also very efficient. The slaughterhouse doesn't produce so many animals who have just died out of fear, have injured themselves or tried to resist. And so their bodies cannot be used for profit anymore. So uh, certain forms um, of innovation uh, are also problematic, even though on the first glance, they, they look um, as a step into the future. So wants to say, a depoliticized notion, an abstract notion of empathy is a poor ally when it comes to issues of power. And compassion often also has problematic aspects. Let us not forget that a certain prisoner called Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf during his Landsberg imprisonment in Bavaria on the Wagner family's writing paper, a very famous reproductive context in which vegetarianism was highly prized as a morality of the master class. Also, by the way, in India, there are regular riots where meat eaters are, are killed, um, but this often has the ethnic uh, envelope. The one is the Muslim, the other one is maybe Hindu, but I won't, I will only touch this very lightly, but um, there is also a lot of, uh, there's also a violence and aggression possible in the defense of animals. And then it's not just some humans who are the victims again, but sometimes certain asymmetries in the society are, twi um, are doubled when it comes to animals, you know, then it's always the other, the foreigner, the one who doesn't have our religion, not whatever, that, that's always also bad to the animals, so to speak. But generally speaking, there's a culturalist gesture of the better treatment of animals by better people soaked in class prejudice. And this idea I think is also a legacy that uh, casts long shadows on our ideas of ethical consumption. It is poured in new, into new uh, tubes and reappears in supermarket shelves as a moral imperative of contemporary ethics. So to speak, if you have more money, you can afford better products and also have the money to flee from the maybe climate effects uh, that you produce through your consumption or your living practice or so on. So having more money would then also mean you can be a better person because you can buy better product and so on. So there are also problems with this notion. Generally speaking, the welfare of animal plays a major role for many people, whether it's hunting or zoos or circuses or animal testing, of um, if it comes to fur or factory farming, or, the, or whaling, or animal transportation, or even shooting problematic animals, like the famous Bruno the bear, producing heated debates on, uh, on, all, on all sides. The question of the animal steers the hearts like few other issues. And as long as we ignore for a moment ultra-humanists who refuse to talk about animals until all human problems are solved for good. Most people would probably agree, agree that animals should be protected from unruly, from illegitimate or extreme violence. So making it oversimplifying for the argument, the political front is primarily, primarily characterized by two different approaches. On the one hand, there is animal welfare, which aims to gradually improve the lot of animals. And on the other hand, the animal rights activists or animal liberationists who aim to abolish the ownership of animals. With these differences, most of the other differences uh, fall into place. But regardless, if you're an animal welfare activist or a person more on the side of animal rights or animal liberation, both fronts are united by one thing, 
animals are seen as victims and almost only as victims who suffer the misery of this world. Also, actually 90.9% of all contemporary moral philosophies adopt this essential point when they conceive animals either as eternal moral patients, so you can hurt them, so to speak, not like a piece of stone. You're supposedly in most, most ethic conceptions, you cannot directly harm um, a stone, but you can directly harm uh, an animal as a moral patient, but animals are never moral agents. So this is the central divide. And so animals are only thought in this way very often. I, on the other side, would like to contrast these hegemonic positions with a different perspective. The question, can they suffer, which has been prevalent in animal ethics, at least since philosopher Jeremy Bentham, gives way here to a different uh, interest. I'm interested in thinking about the history of animals and other non-humans from a perspective of struggle. I propose to think of animals as political actors of resistance. So I, I, it's not a modest proposal, but this is, this is a proposal to, in the following, to think of animals not simply as half intelligent or a quarter as creative um, as humans, as it's so often the case in popular science, not as secondary entities with the, without their own ontological quality, but as powerful co-producers of worlds. These worlds can still be dangerous. They can, they're non-innocent. It's not about finding a new hero. It's just, as a first step, broadening a little bit our focal lens and not just always seeing in former times it was the male industry worker, in, so, so to speak, um, and everything was around him um, to broaden our perspective, because I think we need as much as perspective as possible for the upcoming big challenges of, of humanity and the planet. So of course, uh, animal resistance doesn't resemble certain ideas of civil society participation in terms of self-legislation. Animals usually don't draw up petitions they don't start uh, citizens' initiatives, at least not directly. They, they don't vote uh, usually, and they uh, also usually don't uh, run for office themselves. But with the French philosopher Michel Foucault, we could say that critique, to criticize, means refusing to be governed in a certain way. In this sense, every attempt of animals to escape they're, they're being governed in a certain way, or to appropriate space is a practical critique of conditions. So in this sense, my, in my idea, resistance to your own domination is in itself political. And for me, there is a continuum of resistance, forms of resistance. Of course, if you, you have, you're just a bone of an animal and you try to make a tool out of it, there's of course also a um, there's also a resistant element to this bone. You cannot do everything with it. It can break. You have to hold it in a certain way. And then there is the full-blown resistance of a political organization of human beings, and they have fought all different kinds of stuff, and then they are victorious or they are defeated. Uh, so, and I would say between this, just the resistant char characteristic of a post-living thing, like just a bone, you cannot do everything you want with it. It's, res it's somehow resisting. And full-fledged political resistance. So if we take these two things as a pole for this moment, I would say politics happens on many different levels in between. It doesn't, it's not like just the winner takes it all. For humans, everything is political, hardcore political and with, with animals, and it's nothing is political. So there, there are different grades of the political, I would say. And animals are part of this continuum. This doesn't mean that we put them on the same level, necessarily, but it presents us with the task of working out partial connections that exist, I would say. 
And in this perspective, suddenly everything turns around. The entire apparatus of fences, of cages, of enclosures, of surveillance and monitoring systems could be said to be a, a response to the polymorphous agency of animals. And this emphasizes the world building, world forming power, instead of always just taking them as being deficient. Too little ability to speak, too little ability to abstraction, too little ability to plan, and so on, and so on, and so on, as it often happens. Because this also would mean that we exclude a lot of human beings and a lot of human processes, or processes also involve human beings from, um, <clears throat> from the political sphere altogether. We have learned from cultural studies and psychoanalysis that these forms of resistance, pop cultural, or even in your dreams, or ticks, your body does things, and you don't even know why, because he's resisting to a certain situation without you even knowing it. We have learned from psychoanalysis and cultural studies that all these forms of resistance still exist. So neither for humans nor for animals does critique has to be, have to be necessarily conscious or conceptualized. Otherwise, we would live in a world without counterculture, without fashion, without the unconscious, without dreams. All these things are political, but not in the general like strict, narrow sense of the political. For too long, animals have, um, were seen as natural born inhabitants of the realm of bondage. They are ruled by, seemingly, they are ruled by instinct, controlled by genes, executing evolutionary laws. They are determined in every respect. From a philosophical uh, point of view, you could say animals were declared to be victims of reality. And on the other side, we humans have seemingly everybody has everything that the animals don't have. Uh, we are self-developing, we are there's a fluidity, we have an individuality, we pursue happiness, we have freedom, and so on. And the animals seemingly have none of it. However, by placing the concept of solidarity in the foreground, it becomes possible to question the primacy of language, spoken language, and also the logocentric formulation of rights. That's very much connecting language with, with thinking, with reason. In my understanding, language as a political prerequisite for political representation, recognition becomes relative. Or in short, the ape, the monkey, so to speak, the ape does not have to learn the language of the oppressor and verbally negate it in order to resist subjugation. While cultural architectures in agriculture and the biosciences attempt to immobilize and dominate animals through physical devices, animal victimology, every, yeah, you can almost hear this David Attenborough voice. Look, the baby gazelle is running in the wrong direction. And then, of course, everybody knows the baby gazelle will die. And then we, us is needed, yeah, so, so to speak. Animal victimology does almost the same by declaring animals eternal victims and rendering animal resistance and their form of inhabiting the political imperceptible. It becomes invisible, unhearable. The contradictions this proposition produces are, of course, wide and deep. It, they have something to do, the contradictions and paradoxes, to take animals as political active agents seriously, have to do, of course, with certain deep-seated convictions of the political. They can be traced back to them as a, as a possibility, um, to the word, the origin of the word um, political. It is known to derive from the old Greek word polis. And polis has a double meaning. On the one hand, it was the term for the religious and administrative center of the ancient city-state. So it was a spatial category. It is a place. And on the other hand, it was also the word 
for the community of citizens gathered there in a certain place to reflect uh, about important things of the city-state. So for as long as the word has existed and was born, the place of politics was defined as a space to which neither plants nor animals, neither slaves nor women had access. Only free Greek men were ad admitted there. All others were banished to the margins of the pol polis, where they either had to work or were eaten. In the Politeia, the famous um, dialogue of, uh, of Plato about these topics of the state, he writes, from these two communities, as Plato, the Greek philosopher, um, from these two communities, the house, oikos, arises first. And Hesiod rightly said in his poetry, a house first of all, a woman, and a plowing ox, a working animal. So this, this, with this, um, this unit, central unit, you need a house, you need a woman, and you need a. a, a, a please, I'm just quoting this this wise man. Yeah, it's it's not my opinion. Yeah, so it, it seems to be um, sovereignty and um, autonomy of some seems to be directly dependent that there are others who are, don't have this freedom. And there is a spatial unit where this ruling, uh, this sovereignty can, can work out. But don't worry if you, um, actually the original was that you need a, a slave, a servant, uh, but in this context, Hesiod rightly says, it is okay to have an ox if you don't have a slave. Yeah? So also the animal uh, plays the role of the, of the <laughs> subjugated other human being in this context. So the community that exists for each day, says Platon, is naturally the house, the oikos, or, or what uh, Charondras calls bread box companions, broadcasting genossen. The house where living together happens is the place where both eat from the same box. So this is one of the first formulation of this context. Uh, and Alpenides from Crete calls them crib companions. So the first inhabitants of the house, prototype uh, of the city, where politics even can start beginning to make sense, the crib companions. The house is nature because it arises from nature, says Aristoteles. For the Greek thinker, however, the house is also culture as a kind of the ori um, um, original cell of the political. And there's a melange between na nature and culture when they start to eat together uh, in the crib. It is society, the city starts, the smallest cell is a co cooperative form of cro cross species coexistence, says a German literary scholar Roland Borgartz. <clears throat> From the perspective of political theory, however, however it is particularly uh, remarkable um, that something is conceived as the basic unit of the political that explicitly includes non-human beings. So you could say politics also in a certain sense, never really looked at it this way, but in a certain sense, politics was always something that had um, something to do with people and what, in what relations they stand with the animals around them. It is also because of this entanglement with humans and non-humans, it's not really clear if the talk of animal rights, as it is conventionally understood, does not also double the problems we already have with human rights. The sad numbers of um, around 50,000 deaths, human deaths, in the Mediterranean that um, that happened in the last uh, recent decades show that universal human rights also is not really powerful as long as they're not linked to civil rights of a certain nation. Yeah. So human, what, what to do with naked human rights as long you, as you're not a citizen of a certain nation? 
a nation that knows how to protect the human rights of its citizens. So human rights in a certain sense and citizenship are based both on the exclusion of non-citizens and non-humans. The Russian philosopher Oksana Timoveva therefore points out that under current conditions, animal citizenship rights would only be thinkable with an apparatus of border protection agencies, which would prevent illegal animals from the forests of the global periphery from reaching the happy European fields. And this is, one sense is a little bit tra tragical, on the other side, a little bit comical, but actually it is the case. So the, um, the European Union has formulated certain home species that has to have to, should get a special protection. So there's also a nationalization or a regionalization happening, but this was happening for a long time. It just gets new forms uh, nowadays. <clears throat> Coming more to the topic of um, cohabitation and the habitat. The problem is that animals not only inhabit uh, our spaces, but also our dreams and even our nightmares. So there is, for example, maybe very known to a lot of you, currently there's a lot of buzz going on for quite a while in connection to African swine fever. African swine fever. And the associated calamities um, produce a lot of heat also in the scientific sphere. The idea is here that a pandemic uh, could be transmitted by wild boars and then jump over to the industrial hog. And then millions of industrial pigs would have, have to be killed. And would, this would cost a lot to the industry. However, Dreams and fears are not always um, the, the best counselor. If you remember the, the famous pictures of the former uh, German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who just showed the erection of huge fences between Denmark and Germany against the pigs. But of course, as we know, pigs can swim. So it is not, <laughs> it is really more for the media. Look, we put fences against pigs uh, in the forest, but it. <laughs> It won't. It won't help against swimming pigs, obviously. Just more for the human mind to calm the human mind in this context. But non-Africanized or just ordinary German wild animals are also increasingly taking refuge in the city. You could also call it fleeing. Because these in internal migrants come here because monocultural agriculture and hunting have destroyed their habitats. More and more animals are finding asylum in the city, having fled from the necro pastoral landscapes of contemporary Germany. The urban patchwork of wasteland, building site, ru half built ruins, cemetery for the peace of the dead, and even parks, as well as numerous food stalls and urban food festivals, and so on, not least urban architecture itself provides habitats for many different species due to the differentiated spatial diversity and the wide variety of art historical architectural phases and building types. And this historically controversial issue of invasiveness, now suddenly species are coming, is closely linked to the concept of the habitat which were first used in Carl von Linné's Systema Nature from 1758, a work that marks the beginning of modern zoological nomenclature. But while the Latin term habitat simply means he, she, it lives, it's a doing, it's a performance. It was also used as a verb by Linné. It later ossified, it became, so to speak, stone and bone and took the meaning of a specific spatial territory or territorial unit, so to speak, which was then characterized to be tra traversed or, or ingressed by exotic, alien, non-indigenous, novel organisms. Of course, as, as soon as you have a habitat, you have then invasion. Of course, there's the concept of niche inside a habitat where different species can live next to each other because they're 
live in different niches, sharing the same habitat. But generally, and this is a, a broad uh, proposal again, um, that has to then, of course, be researched in detail um, in relations of its validity, would be to remind us all of the emergence of nations, the idea of a nation with fixed, stable, and controlled borders, and simultaneously, the emergence of the novel, a roman, uh, as a literary form. Well, also quite something new. For a long time, it was epics, um, other forms of literature. But the novel, it has a beginning, it has an end, it has borders, it has a protagonist, it has challenges. So it's, uh, I would say it's not simply by accident that the nation, the habitat, and the novel um, emerged roughly in a comparable time frame. So also the question how we speak about our lives and the, the life we're describing play, plays a role. It's not just literary on the side, but it, it, it has effects on the deep level of our epistemic modeling of the world. In my understanding, there can be no nature without culture and no culture without nature. Donna Harry has the famous phrase, nature culture. For me, it is a proposition to take these both terms always, like my general approach uh, is, as relational terms, relationality, at the, at the same time to, be, to pay due respect to materiality. The both elements in my thinking, in my way to produce um, theory, these are two elements, Relation, relationality, uh, relation between city and animals, nature and culture, whatsoever. And the other is materiality, not just discourses. Uh, so in a certain sense, you could say, for me, life forms with Donna Haraway are also an argument in themselves. Life forms are not an illustration of other arguments. Look, this animal does it. But the way a certain animal acts Sometimes they're ignored by the scientists because it's simply too strange. They don't know really what to do with it. So we won't speak a lot about it, even though a lot of scientists know, know that. Eh? So the way a certain animal acts and does something is in itself an argument. Yeah, not just an illustration of an argument. Yeah, but it also means that the pigeon, for example, and I wrote a little bit about this animal in the urban context. It can be seen as, you know, the bringer of peace and stability, or on the other side, the rat with wings, the punk of urban, urban space, the squatter, and so on. But it doesn't matter if you take it as a you know, holy symbol or as an unholy symbol, either the side of... Yeah. Still, the dove, the pigeon can just fly away and leave us back. You know? So there's, for me, also an element of resistance and materiality in the living world that does not fully... not fully gonna inhabit uh, my conceptions. Yeah? So, transculturality could be a useful term, transculturality. This is a, a notion that has been widely discussed the last 20 years. Um, it goes back as transculturation, it's, it's a verb, um, by the Cuban thinker, Fernando Ortiz. Fernando Ortiz is regarded to be also the father of Cuban, uh, Cuba, island, uh, Cuban anthropology. And with transculturality or transculturation, he was um, hinting at the topic that every culture, every cultural ensemble in itself has 1,000 tangents, um, fractures, um, moments in itself, just German culture. What could it be? Social democratic culture or more entrepreneur culture or green culture or gay culture. One million German culture is one million cultures. And they're not always living happily, so to, so to speak, with each other. And the same for everything else. This is just a national example, but you can make it to others too. So there are a lot of elements in every society and there are elements to the outside of society, grabbing it in. Um, there's, so there's not an homogenic culture that's then meeting another culture, and then we have the war of culture or the communication between cultures, but every culture in itself is 1,000 different cultures in tension, in, in correlation, in whatever. So the trans in transculturation is a warning not to homogenize, not produce too fast a, a monolithic block, oh, this is this, and this is that, and then they intermingle. 
On the other side, the trans and transculturality for us, for me, um, at least, it hints to the porous, porous boundaries between the social political and the natural ecological. So trans cultural would also mean it's not about culture alone, but also about nature and to reflect about these two topics. Also, in this context, not to make to produce homogenic blocks too easily. Nowadays, very often we speak about non-human animals, but it makes a big difference if you are a solitary animal or if you're living usually in groups. Of course, there's a social plasticity to animals. <laughs> also, solitary animals can live in groups and group animals can live <laughs> as individuals and many things. But there is something and material inclination coming with us into this world. And it makes sense not just to say non-humans. And then it is, it is the mosquito and... Um, it, it's the brown bear. It, from a certain sense, it could make sense to use this word. It just means that we should not simplify them. Yeah? Um, and also, transculturality originally uh, was also narrated as a story of sugar as an industrialized plant connected to slavery. And Fernando Ortiz uh, wrote this story in this context. One said you have the plant uh, sugar with industrialization, slave economy, and so on. And then you have the tobacco that needs local knowledge. That's not until now there's famous Cuban cigar. You cannot just put it somewhere else and then everything will happen. So there's about the vernacular, the specific, the, 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 it's not that um, scalable up. So the, the idea of non-human <laughs> non -human ecosphere was in the wording, transculturality from the beginning. And the third one you could take, trans also means for me, transformation, transgression, the possibilities that things change, that things are not that regular always. So for me, this is also an element. Said that much. Cohabitation can mean a number of things. In the thinking of the philosopher Judith Butler, it is about the nowadays very unlikely seeming vision, peaceful vision of Israelis and Palestinians living together. So the idea of living together on, in what context soever, but, but in a certain kind of to, still togetherness, not entirely separation. In France, it refers to the not entirely want, voluntary cooperation between otherwise quite antagonistic parties in the parliament in order to achieve parliamentary, parliamentary majorities. Again, it's an uneasy form of cooperation, but for a common good, so to speak. Or as the uh, present um, Thomas Hauk and also Wolfgang Weiser, who's I think is just I'm not present, put it in their uh, manifesto. It's about the prosperous and spatially supported cohabitation of different species in the city. In any case, cohabitation is always political. And what kind of politics happens there? The Australian thinker Dinesh Vadive argues that we are in a permanent state of war with animals even though we don't always see it as a war on a conceptual level. In this sense, if you would understand our relationship with animals, a lot of animals uh, as war, we could say that cohabitation in the sense of urban planning goes beyond a ceasefire. It proposes an in initiative, a model, of peace. It's a peace offer. It's a punctual, maybe tiny, but it's still a peace offer. In my understanding, the consequences are far reaching to even to think cohabitation, also with plants uh, or, or other uh, entities. That the discussion about the right to infrastructure or the right to housing has not abandoned its anthropocentric perspective despite the ecological turnaround. Architecture and urban discourse are still characterized by a dominant focus on human beings.
On the other side, on the other hand, discussions about the right to the city, the right to housing, refers to initiatives and forms of critical urban research of recent uh, decades that opposed the commercialization and militarization of urban spaces against rising rents, against the displacement uh, of immigrants. And there have been huge mobilizations, um, especially also in Germany, but also beyond. This includes the right to infrastructure, which has been increasingly demanded in Europe in recent years. The right to infrastructure must, un must be understood as a reappropriation and democratization of urban common goods in the sense of David Harvey, as emphasized by Ross uh, Beveridge and Matthias Naumann in their analysis of initiatives for the re municipalization of Berlin's energy and water supplies. They, these initiatives, demand a right to the city and infrastructure. And this makes clear that cities are always contested. The Berlin Tenants Association, Mietervereinigung, at Cottbusser Tor, has formulated an example. For us, the right to the city is the right to stay in the city center, even if we are not rich, young, or creative. It's about having a say in what happens to the city we live in. And to take these two ideas and combine them, to develop them further into a right to the city, including the right to housing and infrastructure, from a non-anthropocentric perspective, would therefore include the right to remain in the urban space and to be taken into account even if you're not beautiful, useful, or human. In a certain sense, architecture, in a very abstract sense, is always colonial in relation to its surrounding environment. And uh, in addition to its carceral, its imprisoning, function for non-humans, architecture today can also be regarded to be killing machines for birds. It's estimated conservatively by natural science papers that buildings alone could be responsible for over 1 billion dead birds a year in the US, in the United States, making them bigger buildings, a bigger um, bird killer than all domestic and wild cats, all pesticides and insecticides, all cars, wind turbines, power lines, and so on, in terms of its killing power. In Vienna, we have our own muni municipal department, um, Emma 48, um, it's, a, it's a department, and their responsibility is to clean the huge, beautiful skyscrapers every morning uh, from a bird uh, bodies, dead bird bodies, that that uh, sort of crashed into the skyscraper every <laughs> every night. Um, it's not funny, I just say it because of this division of labor that's happening. And um, and they don't want the little humans going to school or the bigger humans going to work in the morning. The first thing they see when they leave their beautiful, expensive skyscraper to see all these dead, dead birds being killed. So they are taken and not even seen already in the very morning. And then given to the Natural History Museum, by the way, who, who trains their staff um, how to make taxidermic uh, montages. Anthropocentrism in architectural education, society, and the public are, in a certain sense, enablers, helpers, willingly or not, consciously or not, of this Tanato architecture these architectures of death. If we look at the prevailing architectural discourse and dispositives of contemporary urban planning with regard to their anthropocentric constitution, it is not a surprise that the legal situation gives a hand to design processes and laws even in broader civil society, that expel urban pigeons, feral, wilder urban pigeons, and protects 
small singing birds. So today, in urban and spatial discourses, certain ideas of right and wrong nature becomes manifest that then re-spatialize the human species order. Tasteful, has a great history, um, is ugly, <laughs> is not small, doesn't make melodies and so on. So coming to the end of the, it's another 10 minutes, so to speak. Um, thank you for uh, your patience. We're coming to a positive example. If the design current of animal aided design attempts to take account of architecture's responsibility for, for the destruction of animal worlds and urban habitats by implementing living spaces tailored to different animal species in the facades of buildings. I think this is an essential and important step in breaking up also conceptually urban Tanato architectures, architectures of death. At the same time, it is also important not to replicate the models that have led us into the current ecological misery. Already just to classify very specific animals as beautiful, useful, worthy of protection, instead of allowing the realization to take effect that it is the ensemble, the connection of these life forms that constitute functioning ecologies. And this is also the, um, the way I understand the manifesto for an architecture of cohabitation written by Weiser and Hauke, which focuses on forms of buildings that do not kill, injure, deprive non-human animals of the freedom or harm them in any other way, but rather include non-human animals as users and inhabitants of architecture and actively invite them to use the architecture in order to spatially organize, build, and design a thriving coexistence of non-human animals and humans. One dimension of this cohabitation can possibly outline with the concept of contact zone. This is a concept based on literary scholar Mary Louise Pratt, which is directed against one-sided, manipulative, and passivizing understandings of colonial relationships. And instead understands them as asymmetrical, so the power is not evenly uh, distributed, planning and control, but it is not evenly, um, so it's contested. But they are also asymmetrical zones of encounter, of encounter, begegnung. Contact zones are spaces of aesthetic and police regulation, plan, uh, uh, regulation, planning and control, but, but must be, according to Pratt, also be understood as places of resistance, negotiation, and transfer. Architectures and cities are characterized by constant interaction between diverse human and non-human actors under unequal conditions. Critical design projects such as animal-aided design, for example, but any critical design project. And therefore, in my understanding, always implicitly pose questions such as who will lose, who will win, and who will succeed in, get, in generating solidarity. This does not mean that things are always easy, they are conflict-free or harmless. The aforementioned thinker Vadivi points out that contact zones actually are almost always conflict zones. And I think it may um, help to look beyond our own horizons for a moment, just for one example. In her comparison of biopolitics directed at dogs in urban spaces, researcher Kritika Srinivasan has emphasized that the figure of the ownerless dog, ownerless dog, does not exist that self-evidently as it may seem to us. Let's look to the United States, for example. Stray dogs, dogs without an owner, visible owner, are captured and cared for in animal shelters 
for a few weeks. If the original owner or no new owner is found within three months, strays are killed. This is why animal shelters are among the most important dog killers in the United States. So the instance institution who is there to help dogs, poor dogs, alone dogs, hungry dogs are also those who get these extra jobs. Take care of them, wait for an owner. If not, then um, kill. In India, on the other hand, many strays can be found in urban areas, but they are they're not considered ownerless. They are just street dogs. Their habitat is the street. And I wonder if these certain ideas doesn't have a lot to do uh, also with other things that doesn't necessarily have to do with, uh, with the animal situation, but having a tradition of slavery, of owning human beings, of finding human beings, uh, maybe, I haven't researched it, also models our understanding how to deal with um, non-human non beings. In the, for the Indian context, this does not mean that everything is easy going. There are a lot of things to consider, possibly rabies too, as well as, well as other dangers. But they can be met in different ways too, without the world collapsing. Look, an ownerless dog. <laughs> now it's the end of the world. We have to call the police. We have to call everybody. We will all die. Nah, it's maybe not like that. We can maybe find solutions um, too. A dog that, that is not on a leash and simply exists in an urban environment is unimaginable in many Central European regions. In Austria and in Germany, an ownerless dog is a pet to which no third party has any rights, in which case it can be appropriated in the form of independent position, a possession of a finding it or within two months after its seizure. It is hard to believe that there is a dog in the whole world that could belong to himself, herself, itself. The flying stray, the urban pigeon, also triggers explosions of effect that seem difficult to reconcile with the alleged, alleged uh, pollution or health hazard caused by this pigeon. On the white side, you have, you have these fans of pigeons feeding them, um, then there are the others who say, look, look, they're destroying our culture, our monuments, our houses, our peace, my balcony, um, uh, so to speak. Maybe it's also the freedom of the pigeon that, that disturbs us, that it appropriates the space as it pleases. And maybe sometimes language helps to decipher the regulatory policies here at work. In English, we have two different words for the genetically identical species. It's called either doves, doves or pigeons, but it's the same species. There's just the name pigeon. It already just the sound where dove, you know, white soap, maybe even it's beauty, it's calm, it's soothing. Yeah. And there are symbols of monogamy and peacekeeping attaching to very old religions that are and myths that are even older than the Roman Empire uh, and so on. But there are also notion registers of animals, what animals are what and whom we like, who we, who, whom we allow in our spaces and whose image change rapidly in very short time. On the other side, you have the red of, wing, um, uh, the, red, um, of the air. The only difference between these two species is their visibility in their movement in space. One appears legitimate, the other not. Coming to the very end, design strategies also intervene in the order of the aesthetic. An essential power of critical design strat strategies is not only to, in the words of Marion von Osten, not only to design objects or processes, but also to bring potentialities and ideas into the world that initially seem unrealiz uh, unrealizable, but point to a possible future. So critical design strategies is also about that. Sometimes they, um, solve problems 
sometimes they make problems. Sometimes I think it's also important for design to produce a heat, a fuzz, to allow whole society to, to come together and then say, do we really want that? But sometimes it's also even allows us to imagine stuff. Okay, we'll out the, I will leave out the example of the bee and come to, to my last um, half page. Making the demands of others part of the equation also means to relativize our sovereignty. Teilhabe also means Teilgabe in, uh, in German. It's very easy to say participate, but somebody will also have to give a little bit of their power away. So participate, participate, participation uh, also means sharing. We will have to give up something. For example, the idea of a completely controllable and manageable environment. All forms of life inhabiting the planet influence each other in complex ways that are neither fully understood nor controllable. It may also mean welcoming unintended landscapes, landscapes that were never maybe really planned in this way. They are encounters with nature. And they are breaches, also with nature, but with culture, with everything else too. Such breaches of disorder, unintended landscapes, are habitats for unexpected forms of sociality. Or maybe of those we don't think about when we're planning urban life. There are a lot of human beings too that nobody really thinks a lot about. A lot of times. There are wild commons of urban nature, places that belong maybe to everybody, also, be, also animals and humans. In a certain sense, you could say they are the spatial equivalent of free time. Spheres of existence that have not been bulldozed by profit maximization or swallowed up by extended reproduction. Cohabitation for me is a post-heroic perspective post-heroic on both sides. And it does not prove like in the, the rhetorics of the globalization critical movement that another world is possible, but that a thousand other worlds exist. They also exist in all with all their complexities and problems. Living with can promote the, the development of neighborhoods. The closed residential um, complexes of gated communities are the opposite because neighbors are beings whose presence we have not chosen. You can never meet a neighbor in a gated community because you always have chosen to be him or her next to you. Last thought. Every urban transpecies sociotope is associated with specific social relationships that can offer opportunities for non-regulated or on the other side, purely commercial subjectivation. Sometimes there's a lot of applause when in Ingolstadt, a housing cooperative works together with its post-migrant tenants to save the hedgehogs. <laughs> yeah, you have the... The Germans, Germans, as you would imagine them, maybe. Uh, and then you have these new Germans. It all work together to save the hedgehogs. And everybody is applauding. Also beehives or sparrow colonies can speak when, when thought connected with human beings to a different way of becoming human and becoming animal. That's why it's another reason why we, uh, we're doing uh, ourselves a disservice if we allow them all to disappear be behind the slogan of a narrow ecological or economic utilitarianism. Look, this species is very important because it will save us. Yes, this may be the case, but maybe it's pre precisely a species that is despised today and to whom we deny a life on a window still, or on a building alcove, that, that we will later maybe owe our collective survival tomorrow. So in the 
in the words of uh, my deceased uh, PhD advisor, um, shortly deceased, um, and my colleague Marion von Osten in her last text, she used this uh, beautiful sentence with whom I want to close. Let's not scare away the future. It could nest in a niche of our present. Thank you for your um, patience. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Follow us in this shift to multi-species design through Ecolopes. Find out more about our research on www.ecolopes.org and on our social media platforms.